So now that we've had a look at how the El Ninos occur, it's time now to go on and take a look at the impacts. And the specification wants us to take a look at the impacts in the global winds and the precipitation. Now this will give you an overview of what we're going to do uh, as we explore these first of all. So the impact on the global winds, we begin by looking at the impact on the trade winds. Um, you'll already get a big hint as to what that will be from our study of the formation of the El Nino. Then we'll also look at the impact that that has on the tropical storms. And then in terms of precipitation, we're going to do a little bit of a tour of the world. But the overall pattern is this. You're going to get decreased rainfall in some places and increased rainfall in some other places. And the places are listed there for you. So that's our little bit of an overview. Um, but we're going to use our good old faithful GIS map to take the tour of the world. So let's jump in there now. OK, let's just remind ourselves of um, some of the, the basic foundations of this. This would be your normal wind or normal temperature situation across the uh, Pacific Ocean. And if I put on the uh, prevailing winds that we normally get occurring here, you can see that's exactly what we would be expecting. The uh, southeast trades and northeast trades moving the warmer water from the east over to the west, piling up the warmth here. And what you then get is this colder current here um, coming up the coast, the west coast of North and South America. So that's your classic standard year. Now, let me start off by turning on the um, alert called the Sea Surface Temperature Anomaly in January 2016. Um, there was a, a large El Nino event in 2015-2016, and we're really just going to use that event to have a look at um, some of the impacts and tour around the world. So if I turn on the Sea Surface Temperature Anomaly layer, let's see what that shows. Now, the anomaly layer, what does that mean? It means that what you've got here is a representation of how different this is from the normal. Here's our key, uh, plus 5 to minus 5. So this isn't to say this is 5 degrees C. This is 5 degrees C above your average temperature, which is huge, very, very warm. And this is slightly below your average temperature. So what you can see here in this El Nino year is that the warmer water has indeed been moved over here. Now, if I start by showing us then the prevailing winds from January 2015 to 2016, and zoom in just a little bit, you can see exactly how that is in operation. Now, maybe I'll just reduce the transparency of this a little bit so that you can see the arrows coming through. I wonder, does that help? Mm, kind of well. What you can see here is that the winds that are normally your northeast trades are beginning to be reversed here similarly here um, and they're weakening here so this has allowed that warm water to move from where it normally is over here so but that's the impact on the wind so let's turn off the sea temperature anomaly here for a moment and there is the winds and um, these are the winds that were um, prevailing from january 2015 to january 2016 el nino winds let's compare those to typical winds to normal wind patterns now, I can toggle the transparency with this just to let you see them appear a little bit more. Fade them out a little bit. And what you can see then, I hope, is those locations where the winds have changed direction. So the southeasterlies here have become westerly winds, and you're having that reversal in wind direction in around about the tropics, um, which has caused then the warm water to move over here. These are still... Uh, kind of southeasterly here, more northerly here, but they are weakened considerably, which is allowing the water and the warm water to move over here. So that's the first thing that we see in terms of the impact in global winds. You're getting this change in the direction of the trade winds, and especially here in 2016 in the western Pacific, you had them reversing and become westerly winds. Next thing that we want to take a look at is the impact of that on hurricanes and tropical storms. As we'll discover in the next section, these tropical storms are formed in these tropical regions. Um, but what I can do then is to show you some of the impacts that uh, the El Nino's had on that wind pattern that's occurring here. So let's go in, we'll have a look at this. The 2015-16 El Nino year produced a, a record number of um, storms 
in the Pacific here, you can see the uh, number of storms that were um, visible in September the 1st. So basically what happens is that the El Nino tends to encourage storm formation in the Pacific while suppressing it in the Atlantic. Now, how does that occur? It occurs because of the impact it has in something called the Walker circulation. Now, you'll remember when we looked at the formation of the um, El Nino that we're getting the rising and falling typically over the Pacific. So this is your typical situation where you've got your easterly trades pushing the warm water over here. The warm air rises above it, cools and condenses to form the clouds. Then you're getting this return, return current here which sinks down here um, over the eastern part of the Pacific Ocean. But part of that will also then travel west here over the Atlantic. And what that then tends to do as part of this walker circulation is to encourage the rising of air over the hot Atlantic. And that encourages the formation of tropical storms there. So that's your typical pattern here that you've got the falling air that will suppress it a little bit more in the eastern part of the Pacific and the rising air here over the Atlantic, which encourages your hurricanes. But what happens in an El Nino year is this, of course, you get the reversal of the winds. So you now have got westerly winds here, which is moving this rising column of air either over the centre of the Pacific or indeed further to the east. Now that then means as the air moves away, as it diverges in the upper atmosphere, then it'll sink back down again over the Atlantic. And the sinking air suppresses the formation of your hurricanes in that location. So when you get an El Nino year, it encourages the formation in the Pacific and it suppresses the formation in the Atlantic. Now, let's take one look at an example of that. We'll take a look at this again in a moment on the um, GIS map, but this is Cyclone Pam, which formed in March 2015, the second most intense tropical storm of the South Pacific Ocean, and it devastated this little island nation called Vanuatu in um, the southwest Pacific here, um, kind of between Australia and New Zealand. So if we take a look at this, it'll show us a bit more of the impacts that that has had. The true devastation caused by this storm has still to be discovered. But where aid teams have managed to reach, they've found homes flattened and businesses destroyed. The death toll simply isn't known yet. The president of Vanuatu has called Cyclone Pam a monster. And on road after road, there's evidence of the terrifying impact of the fierce winds. It's just very frightening. You don't know what to do. It makes you... Uh, panic and not really know if I could face another day. Families are trying to work out how they rebuild their lives. Many children are among those left effectively homeless. They were really scary, they cried and I cried also. But I just I just have to be strong for them. All the houses were blown out. Everybody have lost all their properties. And uh, all the fruit trees are all blown over. Help has started to arrive. The airport in the capital, Port Vila, was damaged, but the first flights carrying aid supplies have now been able to land, and charities say they are badly needed. This river has come and risen probably more than four metres over this barrier um, to, uh, to cover the entire roads, sweeping everything in its path away. There are fears about what's happened elsewhere. Contact still hasn't been made with some of Vanuatu's remotest islands. The storm itself has now moved towards New Zealand, but it's weakened. At the height of its power, wind speeds reached around 300 kilometres an hour. It's a difficult. I am praying that uh, they, they are able to cope with the situation they have on the ground right now. Even in my own family, I have the last time I, I, I spoke to them when I left last Thursday. There is a concern that these images of devastation are only the beginning and a fear among aid workers of what will be found when they reach outlying islands. Chris Buckler, BBC News. So you can see those devastating impacts on that poor island nation. One final thing we'll look at here is uh, an animated GIF that shows you the um, 
tropical storms in an El Nino year and tropical storms in normal conditions. So the best thing to do is to focus here, first of all, in the western part of the uh, Pacific. And if we look at the date, what's happening here in the El Nino compared to normal? El Nino, normal. And then have a look over here, same thing. El Nino, normal. El Nino, normal. And what you can definitely see is that there is a greater number of tropical storms and more of the red ones, which are your higher category tropical storms. Now then, let's take a look here over the Atlantic Ocean. This is your El Nino, normal. El Nino, normal. El Nino, normal. And you can see in normal conditions there's more El Nino, there'd be fewer of those storms. So that shows you the suppression there over the Atlantic and the encouraging of the storms over the Pacific. Now, if we turn on, uh, let me see, I think it's this one and this one which shows you Cyclone Pam, it shows you a little bit of the location of where that's happening. So there's uh, Vanuatu there, this is the capital of it, and you can see that the storm came down, it formed up here to the north and then came down, intensified here uh, with wind speeds in, in something in the region of 135 miles per hour, hugely, hugely devastating. Um, then as it moved further south, it began and re reached um, in towards New Zealand, it began to uh, tail off a little bit to <laughs> only 70 miles an hour, still a big storm. But that's just one little example. The general principle is that you're getting uh, an increased number of tropical storms here, decrease here because of the disruption of the walker circulation. Okay, let's turn these off. And next up, what we're going to do is take a look at the impacts on the precipitation. Now, I've added these onto the maps. Anything that is orange is drier than average and everything that is blue is slightly wetter than average. So if we just have a quick scan around the planet, we can see that the El Nino effect is causing changes in global precipitation patterns. So again, with reference to the 2015-16 one, we want to have a little bit of a look at um, what some of those uh, would be. So we're going to go close to Vanuatu again, down in here to Fiji. So I'm just going to show you where in the world this is come in around about here and there is Fiji now if we have we look at some of these islands here we'll look at Fiji and Tonga and things like that drier than normal now I'm not going to go over all of these in detail with you if you do want to read them you can pause the video and have a read through this is just to give you a little bit of a sense here of the reduction here that um, the drought that's uh, related to the El Nino left in Fiji about 67,000 people 13 percent of the population was living in drought had an impact on the farming as well uh, if you come over here Papua New Guinea where's Papua New Guinea well, we'll just zoom out a little bit. Uh, here's Papua New Guinea here. So in Papua New Guinea, again, you've got um, drought conditions there. 2.4 million people affected by drought, especially the poor rural farming communities as well. And then into Tongo, and Tongo is just here um, to the east, southeast of uh, Fiji, in around about here. And again, we had... Um, um, massive impacts of a drought. The 80% of the locally grown tar will be damaged. If you want to read those in detail, you can pause the uh, video and have a look at those. So that's the first. You're getting this reduction in precipitation in the western part of the Pacific Ocean. But we also had impacts here on Australia. Let's have a look at what some of those impacts are. Uh, so by string of, spring of 2016, Australia had its third driest spring on record, limiting growth at the end of the season. Now, if we have a bit of a look here, um, the reason why I've chosen this is because it allows you to do this comparison. These photographs were taken in the same locations. Here's the tree. Do you see the tree on the left-hand side there? Um, normal conditions, El Nino drought. You can just see the impact that that's having, a significant reduction in the amount of water available. Again, taking the same location, watch the trees. 
the reduction in the reservoir as a result of the drought and the fall in the rainfall. And here's a swamp, or, well, it was a swamp. Now, that doesn't even look like the same location, but if you look at this tree over here, see, as I swipe across, it's exactly the same tree. It's exactly the same tree. Apart from that, you wouldn't even know that that's even nearly the same landscape. Um, the swamp that has become um, absolutely dried out as a result of that. Next place we're going to visit is up here in Indonesia. So you can see this is part of a larger dry area, I guess. But there's some different things that are happening here um, in this area. And we're going to take a look in particular at the whole issue of forest fires. That was a major problem in this particular area. Um, let me turn that one on, actually. I think it's better. So let's have a look at this. So the forest fires in Indonesia in 2015, these were made an awful lot worse by the drought conditions. So let, let's have a wee bit of a look at what's going on here. So we had this drought taking place. Now, the drought doesn't necessarily cause the forest fires. Forest fires are part of the way in which the people here are managing the forest. They're turning it into farmland. So that in itself is a major issue, but um, it's a little bit tangential to what we're looking at here at the moment. But as a result of the fires, they liked to do that because that's combined with a lack of rain, then you had serious number of fires and a significant impact on the air quality. This is showing the number of people affected by acute respiratory infections in these different areas. Each of these little dots represents some of the forest fires that are happening. You can see just how extensive they are. Um, this is showing you some of the hotspots, showing the concentration of fires, how, moderate, how far around they spread, and then showing you some of the haze that came around as a result of these. Uh, and then a satellite image with the little hotspots shown on there, and then just that smoke that was pumped out across the area uh, as a result of that. So you can see here that you're going to get some really very, very significant areas of um, impact here. Just to give you a sense of where we're at with this. See this little island here in this kind of triangular shape? That's the island here and the triangular shape there. Now, this layer is a pretty intensive layer, so it seems to be struggling to load here. Um, so it, it, you know, th these gaps here are no forest fires, it's just... There's so many bits of information, it's going to take ages to load. But you can see, even if I zoom in here, just how many of these little individual forest fires there are. Loads and loads and loads of little fires that have been lit in these locations, creating that overall uh, impact of these fires in this area. Okay, let's zoom out again. I'm going to turn that one off. And the next location that we're going to go and visit is up here to India. So again, you can see that India is drier than average. So let's have a look here. India below average monsoon rains in June to September. This has reduced the output of rice, corn, cotton, and so forth. Uh, below average rainfall in October to December fell, which affected the wheat. So let's have a look at some additional information on that. So you can see here um, some figures that were released, the 2015 monsoon that occurs in India. Now, the monsoon is a, as a result of seasonal reversal of winds. Now, we don't need to look at the details of that for the specification. Just notice that we do get the seasonal reversal of onshore to off offshore winds. And the onshore winds bring the rainy season, the offshore winds bring the dry season which gives us the very famous monsoon in India. And the people of India are very, very dependent on that for uh, water, for their crops, all sorts of things like this. And so we had in 2015 a 14% shortfall. This is showing some of the regional variations in that, particularly affecting some different areas. Uh, and it's showing how much actually fell. And to give you a bit of a sense of that, that's... Um, how much falls. Now, this is from June to September. The normal rain is 615, or here in um, central India, 975, which is more than we'd get in Lurgan in a year from June to September. So it's very dependent on that, and you get this reduction occurring from um, that. You get that uh, impact there. Now, you may not be surprised to get an impact 
in this part of um, the world because that's close to the Pacific Ocean. You might begin to start to think, why have we got an impact here? And you're beginning to see that these impacts are indeed global because if we come over here to Africa, we can see that there are a couple of other locations that are impacted by this as well. So if we come, oh, sorry, that's the wrong place. If we go to Southern Africa, I'll put the bookmark in the wrong place must fix that later but if we come in here towards southern africa you can see that there's below average rainfall let's have a look at this so below average rainfall here um, you take a wee look at this map it's showing you the percentage rainfall express as a percentage of what you would normally get and then there's a layer overlaid here showing the major crop zones so you can see there's large areas here of south africa botswana zambia uh, or sorry, um, Zimbabwe and Namibia, places like that, that are getting below average rainfall. And significantly below average rainfall. And many of these will overlap with some of the crops areas. So you can then see the impact that that has. So the reds are, are absolute failure of crops. Um, the oranges are where the crops are poor and you can see large areas there where there is this failure which kind of map on to where you're getting this reduction in precipitation. So even over here in southern Africa. Uh, so the poor rains in the southern Africa monsoon have led to extensive <coughs> pardon me, um, drought across southern Africa. Um, Again, you can read through that if you want by pausing the video, but I want you to note this. You'd be remiss if you didn't put El Nino in the lineup in the search for atmospheric suspects. So El Nino can affect those patterns all the way over there. It's not just in Southern Africa. You will get places in Africa where you get above average rain, but let's come up here to the Ethiopian area, where again, you're getting some below average rain as a result of this. Now, again, here's a very similar map to the one we've just looked at. Um, you can see that you are getting like pockets here where it's above average, but you're getting significant areas where it's below average and significantly below average here. And this contributed to the drought and the water availability. Um, it, the water availability um, compared to normal, um, less than 35% of what's normally available. That's a staggering loss there. And it's no surprise then that you were getting headlines like this at the time. Ethiopian drought leaves 10 million people without food. The government has had to increase uh, to 10.1 million, the estimated number of people who desperately need food. The drought based or blamed on the El Nino weather phenomenon caused by Pacific Ocean while warming. It's a redistribution of the heat, as you know. The worst in 50 years, the charity added. That's a tenth of the population affected by it. So you can see that as we came all the way around here that there are a number of areas around the globe, not just those areas at the Pacific that are affected by this. But let's move over here to America because America is affected by it as well. So if we zoom in a little bit to this part of America, I'm now going on to take a look at the next part, which is the increased part of the rainfall. We've looked at decreased rainfall. What about increased rainfall? Let's have a look at this. So the El Nino shifted the rainfall patterns, which led to uh, an above average uh, amount of rainfall for North America for USA. This is one particular example um, that contributed to that. It's got the name, the December Storm Complex, which brought up to 250 millimeters of rain to Missouri in a matter of a few days. Ooh, that's a huge amount of rain falling there. And you can see this rainfall uh, radar that's showing the amount of rain that's falling. It's like staggeringly large amounts of rain in a very short amount of time. So not a bit of surprise then that um, you got some uh, flooding occurring in the Mississippi River as a result of that. Again, pause this if you want to read over it, but we're looking here at just that um, four to six hundred percent of average rain falling in the past two weeks uh, and the impacts that that has. Again, notice El Nino. The last time that you had something as big as this was in a significant El Nino year. And here we just have uh, an image of that flooding and taking place just to give you a bit of a sense of it. Now, this is showing us then the impacts across the USA. Um, this is in Texas. It was the wettest on record. <laughs> um, but you're seeing here, especially in the 
um, eastern part of the United States of America and into, into the middle part here that you're getting much above average rain and above average in most other places. Strangely enough, not in California in this El Nino period. It typically brings more rain to California, but it didn't really bring it here. Um, so California still can, um, struggles with a drought. In this particular year, it was concentrated in the eastern part of the United States of America. Let's move on down to the next one, because this shows you just quite a nice little animated gif of that storm complex moving up. So you've got snow here, you've got rain here, and there was a whole series of tornadoes that were fed in by the energy in this storm that caused tremendous devastation. So this just shows you the progress through the year. So this is before the El Nino really set in. And you can see that most of the United States were near average or below average, with just a few slightly above average. Right. Watch what happens as the year progresses. So that's December to February 2015. Then March to May 2015, you're starting to see uh, a significant increase. Right. You're starting to see what happened in Texas, but in all some of these other places as well. Still a number of the places here are near average. So let's move on. And then you're starting to see what's happening here in June to August. These areas getting significantly above average. And then... Over here, again, above average. So you're seeing that just a little bit of a snapshot of the different seasons uh, as to what's being uh, caused here. Um, but this shows you a little bit of the impact then that that uh, can have and the flooding that's occurred. So, uh, an increase in precipitation, and finally we'll just pop down here to South America. There's places where you had a decrease in, in precipitation, but we'll just come in here to take a look at this part of South America, which was wetter than average. Again, this gives us a chance to have a wee look at some of the details of this, Paraguay. Um, again, you can read over that if you want to here, um, but showing you in the capital, the um, river running through it was only 30 centimetres away from the, the top of it, uh, overtopping, causing widespread flooding in Paraguay. Um, in Argentina, uh, you're getting the flooding there as well. Uh, into Brazil, this is the president coming and having a look at the southern state of Rio Grande do Sul and um, having a look at some of the impacts of the flooding that occurred there. Um, and so it's in around about this region here that we're talking about. And you can see here that the observed precipitation ranking. Now, again, this is a good opportunity just for you to practice those skills of being able to interpret information presented in different ways. So this is observed precipitation from June, August of 2015. So it's right in that El Nino period. But observations are shown as the ranking in the period 1948 to present. What does that mean? Well, here's an example. For example, a 90th percentile precipitation means that this June to August weather was wetter than 90% of the previous June to August averages. So you can see this region here is well, well above the average. It's you know wetter than ninety percent of uh, that you know previous fifty odd years or so. And this is a significantly wet event here, obviously, as a result of that. 
So that is our overview. Let me zoom out and we'll just remind ourselves of a few of the things that we have discovered. I'll turn on the anomaly one there again. What we've discovered is that you've got the warm air moving or the warm water moving over here. What was it that was causing that? So you have that change in the trade winds instead of being easterly winds. They are coming here from the west to move that over. That has changed the distribution of your tropical storms as well. And encouraging storm formation here, suppressing storm formation here in the Atlantic. And it's led them to impacts as well on the rainfall across the world. Some places that are wetter than average, some places that are drier than average and this change in these precipitation patterns. So we finished where we started with this um, just very, very simple little knowledge schema for you for this one. Globals of El Ni or global impacts of El Nino, sorry, on the global winds, the reversal of the Pacific trade winds, the impact in the tropical storms and in precipitation. Those are the areas where you get de decreased rainfall and areas where you get increased rainfall.